The Late Morning Program with Nam Ras Podcast. Hare Krishna, everyone. You're listening to the Nam Ras Podcast, the number one Hare Krishna podcast in the world. I'm so honored to have Chaitanya Charan Prabhu here with us today. Thank you, Prabhu, for joining us. Really Thank appreciate it. We had Prabhu on for um, a remote episode, I remember we did. Uh, but we have never had you in person, I believe. Yeah, we haven't. And, uh, you know, it's really n- nice to have you in person and a little different dynamic. And as always, uh, thank you to my co-host. Thanks for joining me. Wonderful to be here and special thrill because Chetan Sharan Prabhu is uh, a friend and also someone that um, just really one of my one of my heroes. I think, Nam, you feel the same way. Definitely. Right? Just one of our heroes in terms of uh, an ability to to communicate uh, spiritual wisdom in such a, a relevant, practical way and um, really in your own voice. I, I really feel like one of the things I appreciate most about you is um, you, you you really seem to have found your own voice and you're very authentic to that voice and that's inspiring. Yeah. I know years ago, uh, I don't know if you still use this, maybe we can start here, but years ago, um, the sort of the branding was the spiritual scientist. How yeah. scientific are you feeling these days, Prabhu? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that branding is like a jet lag for me now. <laughs> <laughs> jet lag. <laughs> How does he come up question. with it? Good question. Right, because there's certain certain things, right? You get like known for, and then you're like, do I really this kind of the baggage that I want to carry around? And yeah. I think part of it was you did come from a science background, right? Yeah, definitely. I'd say I was attracted because of the scientific presentation of Krishna consciousness. I remember the origins book was. Uh, game changer, mind blower, both for me. I was amazed to see the amount of rational arguments in favor of the existence of consciousness as an irreducible uh, reality, as well as the existence of God. And that was one of my services initially, addressing scientific questions and doubts. But over a period of time, I found that uh, that just define one side of me. Mm, mm. And I wouldn't get much uh, spiritual or devotional nourishment from it. Now, while I have a heavy intellectual side, but at the same time, over a period of time, I learned to differentiate between intellectual nourishment, you know, like relational nourishment, spiritual nourishment. Mm, maybe I would differentiate as devotional nourishment also. Mm. So... I do get still intellectual nourishment. I'm in touch with science. But right now, I see myself more as uh, three things. Like rational, uh, literary. Literary in the sense I like to do wordplay. And that is, I would say that gives me more nourishment right now than anything else. Just playing with words. Sometimes I feel I'm more word conscious than Krishna conscious. Well, you, it, we'll, we'll come back to that, I think, because uh, <laughs> yeah. you've gotten a little famous for some of your witty aphorisms and <laughs> right it's like yeah. it's like uh you know um it's almost that maybe that's becoming kind of part of your your brand so to speak but we, we'll talk we can talk about, sure, about yeah. that a little bit more but you said so so rational so wordsmith that, and then what's the third so third would be more of uh creative i started recently doing diagrams and using writing uh-huh. and drawing in my classes i want to in future do uh diagrammatic explanation of each verse of the Bhagavad Gita. Mm. One diagram for each verse. So yeah. let's, let's hang on for just a minute. Yeah. Actually, the sound carries quite a bit. So even the soft chanting will carry. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Continue. <laughs> let's, yeah, maybe let's back up. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then, I'm sorry, you're going to have to do some... Yeah, yeah, we'll cut that out. Yeah. So the rational part, I still have that. And I try to explain or at least first of all, understand myself things in a way which can make sense to me. And then I try to make help them make sense to others. So I always try to answer questions or address issues from multiple perspectives. So at least one perspective will click. So in many ways, you know, I try to write articles or give classes 
which would have nourished the Chaitanya Charan of 2005 or 2006. So oh. I felt that, uh, say the first four or five years, I was, 1996 I was introduced, 1998 I joined. But the first two, four or five years, I was very vibrant. But then I started noticing that uh, I still had a lot of questions. And my questions were not appreciated by others. So then I started noticing a significant difference that for me, the philosophy was you know, not just a part of my life. It was my life in one sense. The philosophy was for me a means for exploring and understanding reality. But for many people around me, with all due respect to them, for them, philosophy was a tool for preaching. And I realized it's a huge difference in approach itself. That means, okay, I have good points by which you can persuade others. And then they start chanting, they start becoming initiated. And of course, I feel anyway, Krishna consciousness adds quality to people's lives, adds value to people's lives. So that is good. But that was not my approach. And so I had to find the like-minded association where the philosophy as a, you could say, search for truth, search for understanding. Not just a search for finding attractive ways of attracting people. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm? There are so many things which even we as devotees can explore. And this is when I started looking at the Bhagavad Gita in a fresh light. You know, in the 10.8, the Chatushno Gita, 10.8, it says that uh, Buddha, Buddha Bhava Samanvita, they are already enlightened. But then the next verse, 10.9 says, says Bodhayanta Parasparam. Mm. So the enlightened are enlightening each other. So it's not a static, linear yeah, thing. Exactly. There's something dynamic about that. So Prabhupada says in one lecture that the pure devotee knows Krishna. They're not pure devotees, but the pure devotee knows Krishna. And yet, because Krishna is unlimited, so they keep unlimitedly knowing Krishna for all time to come. So, so for, for me, even now, philosophy is much more about discovery than about delivery. Mm. So for most people, with all due respects to them, and I know they're not that intellectual, and you could say that I have a scarcity of talent or scarcity in variety of talent. We have these various personality scores, you know, the types of intelligences. Mm -hmm. So my verbal intelligence is very high. My mathematical intelligence is very high. My intrapersonal intelligence is very high. But my musical intelligence is zero. My interpersonal intelligence is not very high in the sense that I would, I'm much more of an introvert. Mm. And then my other special visual intelligence, organizing, whatever that intelligence is very low. So I see many other devotees, for them, intellect is just one side of them. But for me, you know, that's maybe that's the only side I have in one sense, in terms of uh, connecting with Krishna, serving Krishna. So you're always approaching things in this way of kind of, not through your head necessarily, but but see, through this kind of lens of understanding, seeking, exactly, philosophizing, yes. if that's a word. Yeah. In, in more simpler terms, you're saying that instead of trying to jog your mind or use your brain to of, of primarily try to spread Christian consciousness or communicate it, you're thinking, why don't I internalize that more or use that philosophy more for myself rather than others? Is that what I'm hearing? Yes. I know I would say. Yes, in the sense that yes, definitely. For me, philosophy is about nourishing myself. Right. But it, of course, and I would love to share it. That's my life. Yeah. Uh, but uh, it's a it's an ongoing process of learning the philosophy itself. Hmm. Hmm. Whereas it's before, it, it seemed or it, it can feel like, in a more stereotypical sense, it's like a one and done. It's like a checklist. Like learn this, check. Yes. That truth is covered. Next one. And then if I can cover all my bases, mm. then I can convince someone else, cover all their bases, and we can just keep multiplying yes, that way. True. But what you're talking about is, you know, it's an ongoing process of discovery. And even as a teacher, or I don't know if you use the word preacher these days, that's a whole other conversation. Yeah, <laughs> but as someone who shares or does outreach, um, you're also still learning. You're also still... I love mm. that. That's great. I mean, the, the thing, I don't, I don't want to lose it because I want to, you know, let, let's go back to it a little bit. But I love this sort of what the, the idea, if I heard correctly, what motivates your outreach now is kind of what would have nourished Chaitanya Charan 
in 2005, you said, yeah. right? Um, so, so I was saying that in 2003, four out of five, six years of practice in Bhakti, I started getting a lot of questions. And I found that there are not many people who could give answers that were satisfactory. Yeah. So fortunately, our movement is very big and there are devotees also who are you could say, dedicated to intellectual exploration, intellectual growth. Uh, so I got connected with many such devotees and that was a lifesaver for me. But that's what I'm trying to do uh, right now. So sometimes I feel that the and I have also evolved in my classes in the past. My my style was always analytical. But my in the past, my content was also philosophical. So I would delight and say, for example, what is the difference between Chinta Veda Veda and Vishishta Advaita or something like that. Which is, there is an audience for that, but not, it's not of much relevance to most people. So now I am trying to take topics that are practical, mm. but have a serious analysis of those topics. So you're employing the analytical kind of approach, but to practical, lived, experiential type of stuff. Yes, exactly. So relationships, emotions. Oh, nice. Mm, I think those things, I am much better at, I think most of us are like that. We are all better at talking about relationships than developing relationships. <laughs> 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 but to some extent, um, I find that uh, it's nourishing for me also. And I also feel that after I started traveling abroad, I became more of a human being. <laughs> well, in, in the sense of... In the sense that, that uh, I'm grateful for the training that I got as a strict brahmachari. But then in the pursuit of uh, having high standards of renunciation, sometimes we can trivialize and dismiss human concerns just as mundane or as signs of attachment. Mm. Wow. But then as I started, uh, especially traveling across the world, meeting different devotees. So I would say that there was a phase when I was concerned more with deepening my Krishna consciousness, studying scripture, reaching Aradi Acharya's commentaries and deepening. But now I'm trying to do that, but now I feel it's equally important for to broaden my Krishna consciousness. Mm. So, sometimes if we are only deepening without broadening, then we may be well connect with Krishna, but we may actually become very dismissive of devotees with other concerns, you know, they are valid. So, it's, it's actually, you know, I appreciate Grahasthas more, I appreciate even our managers more. Although, as an intellectual, I always have some concerns about the way the institution functions. But still, you know, I understand the challenges that they face. So... It seems like there's just much more scope for human empathy. Oh, definitely. And I, I do feel that uh, things have changed substantially positively over the last one or two decades. There's a lot of recognition mm. of the human needs of individuals. And uh, mental health is no longer stigmatized. Well, even the idea that we're talking about like human needs in relation to devotees, right? Yeah. Because I yeah. think for so for so long there was an idea like that's for that's for those non-devotees out those karmis or whatever you know language mm. pejorative language we would use. But the idea was no, once you become a devotee, you know, all of that is you can say goodbye to it, right? Because just by being a devotee, obviously, or you know, you've now magically cultivated all of the good qualities and right mm. um which i mean obviously i'm being facetious because in real life that wouldn't happen but yeah. because there was no scope for for many of us um even speaking personally here because there was no scope to talk about it out loud you felt like well maybe i'm just not doing krishna consciousness right so i secretly have all my human needs and issues and concerns but i have mm. to present like oh yeah everything's blissful and of course you know um but that, that seems to have changed. Oh, definitely. And and I think that the kinds of um the kind of teaching that you're doing now is is very much a part of that change. Yes. I hope that I'm a small part of that also. So so that brings me to the way my way of studying scripture and 
uh, sharing scripture has also changed. If you consider three circles, there is quite often when we talk about practical application, that's ABCD, you know, association, books, chanting and diet or DT worship, whatever. <laughs> and that's true. That's definitely something which can a person can practice in life. But especially when I started traveling outside India to the West, and I started seeing what are the, when people are looking for spirituality, what are they looking for? Mm. You know, they're looking for the more meaning and purpose in their lives. They're looking for maybe becoming more steady and composed. They're looking for uh, more mind, becoming more mindful. And they're looking for being more grateful. So for most people, when they think about spirituality, they think about these values which will actually bring uh, gr greater value to their life, you can say in one sense. Yeah. So if you consider there is a textual study of scripture as one circle. That why does this verse follow this verse? What yeah. are the different commentators saying about this particular verse? So that was the kind of study I did. And that's that's very sort of typical of like a Bhakti Shastri course. Exactly, for instance. yes. Yeah. Okay. So that's one. And now the yeah. second circle is, you could say, what was, I thought, practical application of scripture earlier. But now I would, I call it more like traditional application of scripture. That means, you know, not traditional. In that sense, this is how you follow the scripture or you study the scripture to be a part of the tradition. Hmm. And that's important, no doubt. Hmm. Hmm. But practical application means not just how I align with the tradition, but how it helps me live my life here and now. So, right. so that is what I said. And say that's as, its own circle, you're saying. It's, it's own, there are definitely intersections in these three circles. Yeah. So, practical application of scripture. Uh, say, for example, in the past, we were quite dismissive of human relationships. Yes. Now, but if you look at, for most people, the social need is important. And we, can we learn from scripture how to avoid misunderstandings among people? How can we be more empathic in hearing from others? So now we may say these are all mundane values. Well, somehow I have developed a little bit of hesitation to even use the word material and spiritual. Mm. I prefer the word maybe more like selfless and selfish. Because, you know, material... You could have Sattvaguna, Rajaguna, Tamaguna. And there's a huge difference between the three. Bhaktivinoda right. Thakur said in Chandan Shikshaam wrote that, you know, we shouldn't even conflate Rajaguna and Tamaguna. They're what to speak of Sattva. Sattva. <laughs> so, so that's a, he, he actually says that, yeah? That yeah. A, he in fact says that Rajaguna can sometimes be like an antidote for the toxicity of Tamaguna. Which is a very strong statement. Yeah. yeah. That if somebody is tamasic, they just have, uh, just, they're just playing video games and uh, uh, drinking and taking drugs and wasting their life. Maybe that person uh, enters into a relationship, has a family, has children, starts taking care of those children. Then it's a job. Way. Yeah. Starts earning a paycheck, right? Like, yeah. it's it's not spiritual necessarily, but it's something more constructive is what, yeah. yeah. And it's going to make a significant difference for that person's life. From at least from that perspective, from where they were. Yeah. So, so I so in that sense, sattva rajas tamas. So rather than seeing this is material and this is spiritual, you take people from material to spiritual. I see it more like a continuum. Sattva rajas, that's a tamas rajas sattva, and then we go higher and higher towards the spiritual. So the way I try to share wisdom now is that, and I try to apply it myself also, not just share, is that. You know, that we provide people resources for raising their consciousness. Now, it's up to them which resource they want to take and how much they want to take it. Hmm. So, if somebody just rises from tamas to rajas, that's also good. Yeah. If somebody rises from tamas all the way to sattva and shuddha sattva, that's great. But we want to add value to people's lives. And in yeah. one sense, that is also the mood of the Bhagavad Gita. The Bhagavad Gita. So many places Krishna says, you can't do this, do this. You can't do this, do this. Yeah. The 12th chapter especially, even while talking about Bhakti, is giving multiple levels. Right. Then, now of course, Krishna does say, Sarvadhaman Prithija. That's the, we will come to that 
how I see that verse now. But that's the conclusion. That's not the only teaching of the Gita. So, so in all aspects of the scripture, you feel there is ways to look at it in a perspective of that I can add value to my life with this. Oh yes, every definitely. aspect. Oh yes, definitely. Say, for example, um, you know, there's a churning of the milk ocean. That pastime is there. Yeah. Now, you could go into the allegorical, symbolic aspect of that, but just look at it from a what happens over there. Devatas are energized by Sattva Guna. The Asuras are energized by Rajoguna. And both of them are churning. And both of them are able to balance. So the energy from Sattva and the energy from Raja in this case is equal. <laughs> oh, yeah. Which is interesting, isn't it? Yeah. Right. So sometimes there's just two different modes. But two people can from two different modes can work together. For one they're, they're, you could say yeah, that. that. That's so good. <laughs> He's doing this in real time. <laughs> right? So you like I mean, sorry to like, you know, they say like the worst yeah. thing, the most unfunny thing you can do is explain a joke, right? Right. Yeah. So probably the worst thing I can do is try to dissect the this beautiful, like but you, it's like exciting. I can actually see the wheels turning almost. So you take a, a story like the churning, mm. right? Sea journey. <laughs> That's a whole other topic. Do you know about this thing, you know about sea the journey? sea journey? When Srila Prabhupada was dictating the sea churning pastime, or it wasn't somewhere other book, when they were listening to it, they the, the people who were typing it, they they wrote uh, sea journey instead of sea churning. Prabhupada oh. says sea churning. <laughs> they this heard like sea a, journey. This is like one of the book changes yeah, yeah. Okay. arguments that, yeah. oh, like, what do you do? Do you keep it sea journey or do you keep it sea churning? Because we know what Prabhupada meant, but he didn't say mm. that. Or he did say that, but the devotee who was typing it was typing something else because that's what they heard. Anyway, mm. that's a real side <laughs> discussion. But. It's also a side discussion we we disagree on very much because he's sea journey and I'm sea churning on this. I'm, I'm, not, I'm, sea, I'm not sea journey. No, you're you're uh, you're, not. you're not into the, the book changes, right? Anyway, I, I mean, there's there's different ways of looking at it. Annotations, no annotations. I'm all, I'm I'm all about annotations, book changes. I think the change of fonts for sure. I have some <laughs> suggestions of some good fonts. Anyway, let's not. If I ever see. A BBT book in Comic Sans. That will be the end of my... No, okay. Anyway, going back to... Going back to... Going back to... But, but just because I... It, it's so... I don't know. I'm just... I'm almost getting chills, right? Like, you're, you're taking that story. You're seeing it. And then you're looking at kind of what's going on. And like, it's almost like... like like almost organically, a kind of a very applicable lesson starts to emerge. That's, That's what it feels like. Two people like. can work together. That two, well, well, so on so many levels, right? So on a very practical level, like two people can work together, two very opposing elements. So like that, sort of, there's a very practical takeaway there. But then even going more subtly of like, well, what does it mean to have sattva and rajas in balance, right? Because that's not usually how we talk about the gunas at all. Exactly. No, at least when I was to, coming you up. You just have to be in sattva. If 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 you're even going to allow the gunas into the conversation, oh, actually yeah, to right. transcend even subtle, <laughs> transcend, yes, yes, but yes. maybe you know a yeah. soft-hearted liberal speaker will no, just, <laughs> maybe will allow sattva, right? But the idea of sattva and rajas in some kind of dynamic balance, like I don't know, I don't really hear classes on that. But yeah. you took a very traditional shastric story, and just in a matter of like less than a minute, yeah this yeah. theme kind of emerges. Is that what happens when you're preparing a class? Somehow Krishna's mercy is there, yeah. I see things that are controversially uncontroversial. <laughs> <laughs> that's another one of his... That's a They're Chaitanya churnism. <laughs> yeah, right. They're what do you mean by controversially <laughs> uncontroversial? Well, they're uncontroversial in the sense that they're obviously there. Okay. Mm -hmm. But they're controversial in the sense that that's not the way we look at things. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes, yes. Like the Chitakidu pastime, for example. You know, he says that which mother, which father. Mm? Mm. Now, but when does he say it? After this life has ended. And now he's honest that soul is on the journey afterwards. So those relationships cannot be devalued while they are existing. Mm. Now, when he has gone from there, now he's had so many lives. And at that time you can ask which father, which mother. But while we are in a relationship, 
it's important to function in those relationships. We have the same Bhagavatam, 10th canto. Krishna is telling Vasudeva and Devaki that, you know, as a child I should be serving you, but because of circumstances as a way, I couldn't do anything for you. Yeah. So I'll try to serve you now. This is the duty of a child to serve the parents. So in that instance, there's a valuing of the parent-child relationship. Exactly. In the Chitraketu... But the devaluing, when it is happening, it is not when... So the way it way sometimes it's present all relationships were temporary they've right. had so many relationships yeah but while we are in a relationship you know, it's important that we take it seriously so I feel that there's so much uh, and that insight came about by just noticing the context exactly yeah context is I feel critical so one of the things which uh, I really relish doing the Gita in fact I've written a book called Relishing Bhagavad Gita which is basically see the Gita's verses in the context of the Kurukshetra battlefield and the Krishna Arjuna conversation. So, for example, now if you consider the verse, uh, let's take Sarvadharman uh, Prithich. Um, now, what does that mean for Arjuna over there? Hmm? At a philosophical level, what it means on the battlefield? What does it mean? That they are very different questions. Yeah. So, now we could say immediately it means Arjuna was pulled by two dharmas. His Kula Dharma and his Kshatriya Dharma. And Krishna is telling him, just put aside all your conceptions of Dharma and the highest Dharma is surrendered to me. Maam Ekam Charanam Raj. So, now this is what that verse means for Arjuna over there. It means that you just do God's will. Yeah. But doing God's will does not mean abandoning his Dharma. Because eventually he takes up and he fights him. Right, it would be idea. absurd if, if it meant yeah. don't do this thing I've been conf- trying to convince you to do and that you, that he ends up doing, right? Yeah. So the thing is that when we give up all dharma and surrender to Krishna, after surrendering, we have to do one of the dharmas in this world. Right. And then Arjuna takes up the Kshatriya dharma. But, but he's not doing it as a Kshatriya. He's doing it as a devotee who is serving Krishna through Kshatriya role. So... You know, one of the things, uh, say, okay, so like this, we always say we are parts of Krishna. Mamai Vam Shoji Valuki. Now, what does it mean practically? This was when, when I first got this insight, you know, I myself was thrilled. Mm-hmm. Now, if we are parts of Krishna, that means we have parts in Krishna's plan. If somebody is a part of a cricket team, say Indian cricket team, that means you have a part in the cricket team. Are you a baller? Yeah. Are you a batsman? Are you a wicket keeper? What are you? Yeah. So we are parts of Krishna. It's a philosophical truth. And we often use it to refute impersonalism. Which is good enough, no doubt. But that means Krishna has a plan for us. If we are parts of Krishna, and in one sense, bhakti is, we say Sir Krishna, but Sir Krishna means it's, it's, we mm. try to discover what is the part that Krishna has for us. And then play that. So this idea itself that if Krishna has a part for every one of us and it's always going to be there because we are parts of Krishna eternally. Right. And we, no matter how many mistakes we make, it's not, we, we, we never lose the status of having a part in Krishna's plan. Wow. That's an amazing, that. that's an amazing insight, right? Love that. So you've done that with like all the main topics? Well, not all. I mean, I'm still, it's an ongoing process of discovery. Yeah. But I am doing that. Yeah. So, Dhyayato Vishayan Pumsa. This could be controversial. But Dhyayato Vishayan Pumsa, what does it mean for Arjuna? Mm. You know, he is on the battlefield. So, it's Arjuna is, relatively speaking, he is, uh, you know, he's a very sense-control person. Yeah. Nurvashi offered her, herself to him and he said no. So, my understanding is that this Dhyayata Vishayan Pumsa, of course it applies to us for sense objects. For Arjuna, it applies in the sense of contemplating the warriors on the other side. Mm. It's when he comes in the middle and Bhishma Drona Pramukhtaha, mm. he sees Bhishma Drona prominently. And from the Dhyayato, from that contemplation, Sangha, oh, they are my relatives, they are my elders, how can I fight against them? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then Buddhinasha Pranashati. Yeah. That whole sequence goes down. And in this, you see that actually there's a very dra- drastic shift. Before Arjuna goes in the middle of the battlefield, 
ही से आई वॉन्ट टू नो हु आर हेल्पिंग धार्त राष्ट्र से दुर्बुद्धेर युद्धे प्रीच की ऋषभ हु आर आउट देर हेल्पिंग द इविल माइंडेड सन ऑफ दित राष्ट्र एंड एज सुन एज ही सीज दैम सो दैट्स वन ट्वेंटी वन ट्वेंटी ट्वेंटी थ्री एंड एज सुन कम्स इन मिडल वन ट्वेंटी फोर ट्वेंटी फाइव आफ्टर दैट वन ट्वेंटी सिक्स द फर्स्ट वर्स इज स्वजन दीज आर माई पीपल माई पीपल दे आर नॉट सपोर्टर्स ऑफ दित राष्ट्र देर माई पीपल So subtle, right? It's like it's it's subtle, and it's it's once you get it, it's so significant. Yeah. So it's uh so the idea is. I mean, that, even even and this is something that I've really come to. I mean, maybe it's a mini version of what you're talking about, but like you said, it, when it kind of bubbled up for me, I was also I, you know I found it thrilling. But even just reflecting on what Krishna is doing with that Bhishma Drona Pramukata, of all the places, Krishna draws the chariot. Yeah, exactly. Right, pramukata. Like my understanding, I don't know if this is. I'm taking liberties with the translation, but like we have this expression in in English, right? When something's in your face, mm. and there's something that feels right, like there's there's a kind of in your face confrontation in that moment mm. that that Arjuna needs, that we need. Like you know, mm. I can think of, and then for me, this brought up even in my work um, as a chaplain counseling. So many times. It means really kind of being in an uncomfortable place, bringing, helping the the, the person that I'm attempting to counsel mm-hmm. to 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 see what they need to see, to confront what they need to confront, because unless it's it's in the face, they're not going to be able to go through it. They're going to try to go around it, right? Wow, um, true. It's very true. So, so there are two meanings. It could be that he just brought him in a place where Bhishma and Drona were right ahead. You know, the army is formed in many ways. Yeah, he could have got him middle here, middle anywhere. He could have Krishna could have brought him in middle where Dushasan and Duryodhan were visible, right? Mm-hmm. But he brought him where Bhishma and Drona were visible. That's one that, that Krishna did that. Yeah. The other is that Krishna pointed. They were in the middle, but he says, "Uvacha partha pashyaitan samavetan kuruni ti." So Bhish, so so the it's like one part of that verse, one twenty five. It is it is Sanjay speaking, or it's the narrator speaking, mm. and the other part is Krishna speaking. Right. So he came in the middle where Bhishma and Drona are prominent, and just see. So it could be that they, he brought him right in front of them, or Krishna pointed toward them. Just see what do you want to see over here. Mm. So yeah, sometimes, uh, sometimes Krishna uh, exposes us to the most provocative situations yeah. to help to force us to confront the issues. So have you ever had that where it's like, like you have an issue with someone? You're feeling some envy. You're feeling some. There's some dissonance in the relationship, and you're like, you go to a festival or something. Making this up, but you go to a festival and you're just like, this is like the very last person I want to see, and then poof, you just like run into them, or mm. it's like Krishna is like <laughs> putting you in that situation, right? Many times, yeah. <laughs> so, this is also the Gita. I feel is uh, so. The Gita is was a fun example, but other scriptures also. Like we talked about some examples from Bhagavatam. Yeah. So I'm currently working on a book on the Ramayana. So then I was talking about the Wali Sugriv relationship. There was this whole misunderstanding that happens between them, mm-hmm. and then Wali thinks that Sugriv tried to overthrow me and trap me in the queue. So then after that he comes back and he beats Sugriv and Sugriv runs away, and Sugriv thinks you know that let me wait his temper will cool down, but Wali is so caught in his head. Everybody else tells him you know he thought that you were trapped and you had died. He says that uh, you he fed you a lies and you believed him. Hmm. So sometimes we say, and you let time go, anger cools down. But there are two trajectories, you know. Anger with time can become cool, or it can become cold. And nobody can stay at a high temperature for a long time. Right, it's got to go but, somewhere. Yeah, but if you become cool, then you become sort of reasonably peaceful. You know, you are become open to reason. But when it becomes cold, you become very yeah. hatefully peaceful. Your heart becomes harder. Hatefully peaceful. Hatefully, hatefully peaceful. peaceful. <laughs> oh That's gosh. a good one. hatefully peaceful. Wow. <laughs> that 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 cold that you're talking yeah. about. Yeah. So you're calculating how to hit back at that person, and that's angrily waiting. Right. So you're calculating. So revenge is a dish mm. best served cold. That's what they say. Yeah. And then that's what he. That's when you know he decides he cannot. Assa- he tries to assassinate Sugri. We can't do that. Says you betrayed me. I'm going to punish you. And the way I'm going to punish you is, I'll take your wife for myself. Mm. And then that literally ruins the relationship. After and there's certain boundaries you just can't cross, mm-hmm. no matter what happens. So, so I've 
prepared a whole anger management seminar based on this past time itself <laughs> and i gave it to actually a western audience you know i didn't mention there were monkeys i just talked <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I didn't mention there were monkeys. <laughs> Footnote. <laughs> it's a very, because it's a very human relatable thing, ironically. Yeah, exactly. Not quite humans who are displaying it, but you already gave you already gave that yeah. seminar? How yeah. did how was the response? Oh, it was it was very good. Mm. So do you start with like do you start with anger and then go what 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 lila can I turn to that or do you start with the lila and then oh, That's a good question. Oh, I start with concepts. You start with concepts. Yeah. Mm. So I really like the concept today in today's Sunday feast class about boundaries and about like yeah let's talk about it's that. very yeah it's it's very relatable if you have some issue with some devotee how do you deal with that and all those different things it was a very it was a very relatable concept we should talk more about that maybe we can give, give an overview of that if you have some issue with a devotee and then from the Ramayan how we you know, can learn from that. Yeah. Like in that instance, so, if, if I remember correctly, you started with talking about what you've seen in your travels and like issues among devotees and yeah. then you brought in the Ramayana, yeah, right? True. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so now it's interesting. I have got some pushback for this kind of presentation. Hmm. So it's, it's an interesting pushback also. He says, we are here to tell people how to become better devotees, not how to become better human beings. Oh, you know that there are so many books telling them, but then we tell them don't read any other books, is it? It's <laughs> a bit of a catch twenty two there, right? <laughs> yeah, it is totally. Don't read other books, but we're only gonna tell you a very narrow thing. Very narrow. Not that it's narrow, but not that it's in a bad way, but it's just very specific, subject specific, mm. not broad. Right. Well, it's, it's it's very subject specific, and it's also very. I don't know if idealistic is the right word, but it's it's. I think it's beautifully aspirational is the word that I would yeah. use. It's yeah. aspirational, but it's not always relatable. Yeah. yeah. That was my attempt to try to do a Chaitanacharanism. <laughs> I love that. What so, was your response to, to whoever told you that? So I said that I told, I, I get th three, three ways of looking at it. First is that there are a lot of people, let's start with outsiders. There are a lot of outsiders who are looking for wisdom. And if they can find wisdom that adds value to life, their life where they are. You know, they are going to get attracted to scripture. Isn't that good for them? So if they feel, oh, this kind of wisdom is there in scripture, then, you know, Jordan Peterson uh, is a person who, who gave a series of talks on uh, psychological significance of biblical stories. Now, at that time, he was an atheist. Now he says, I'm no longer an atheist. But if you see the comments on his videos, he said, there are people who are saying that I'm an atheist, but I see there's so much value in the Bible. Mm. So It builds a kind of faith. Yeah, it's at least there's something of value in this book. Maybe yeah. I don't believe in God. So that's the first audience. If people where they are at, they can get some value in, the, in our Shastra, why not? The second is that we look at devotees. Most of the challenges that devotees face we may say it's because, you know, you're not chanting Hare Krishna attentively, you're doing not, you're not doing this. But, you know, they're very practical challenges. Yeah. And they need practical solutions. So if, yes, this may not necessarily help devotees grow in their spiritual life, but it can help remove the things that are distracting them from focusing on the things that will help them grow in their spiritual life. If I am very, if... I'm not able to have a good relationship with my my family, my friends, my other co-devotees, then that's going to affect my chanting. That's going to yeah. affect my Shastra study. So that that is also there. That we, we may not be telling, say like in the class which I gave today, I didn't really tell, oh, we have to chant Hare Krishna attentively. But I did say that at the end, you know, ultimately, when we practice bhakti nicely, Krishna uses buddhi yoga. Right. Yeah. And then that, the dhami buddhi yoga and that will help us deal with the issues. So we do talk about bhakti. So, but it's that there are practical issues which have to be dealt with. And if you have wisdom from scripture, then why not have that wisdom? I'm just, I'm curious why the the, the person who was pushing back, um, it almost feels like there's an assumption that it's an either or. So I'm, I'm just wondering why that assumption? I mean, why can't you have, let's say 45 minutes to give a class? In 45 minutes, why can't 
someone who is an adept speaker, adept enough to be invited to to give a talk, you know, to begin with, mm. why can't they do both? Which I mean, yeah. I, I feel like at least this evening, I feel like you you did both. Um, yeah. Maybe it it was the majority of your focus was on more of the practical, but it wasn't like it was it was absent of bhakti. It wasn't like you know. Yeah, you, true. I agree with you fully. So it's like I feel that we need wisdom to even rise towards sattva. Mm. We can't assume we are already in sattva or to speak of shuddha sattva. Yeah. So maybe 50, 60, 70 percent of the class could be wisdom drawn from shastra, maybe phrased in contemporary ways. Yeah. Like the term boundaries may not be there in Prabhupada's purports, but it's a very relatable term. Yeah. And I use it and so 50, 60, 70 percent is, is sattva, which is pointing towards bhakti, but the last part is bhakti. Yeah. So it's only from a few people I've got to push back. I think most people just getting used to it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I guess, I mean, and, and maybe this is a bit of a tangent, but I guess something that kind of, um, that bugs me, it's like a pet peeve, is um, what feels like, you know, that kind of when I say either or, it almost feels like constantly framing bhakti in opposition to everything else. Exactly. Yes. Rather than in a way that actually can integrate with and even... Yeah, can so good part, harmonize, right? integrate, whatever words yeah. you want to use. Mm -hmm. That's what I said, you know. He says, we equate sattva, rajas, and tamas as one whole and material yeah. versus spiritual. Yeah. yeah. But instead, rajas, sat, tamas, rajas, sattva, and spirituality and bhakti, it's one continuum. Yeah. It's the, that's why I prefer the words selfless and selfish, uh, more to spiritual and material. Because in one sense, when we move from tamas to rajas to sattva, we are moving towards a higher level of, higher degree of selflessness. Right. And bhakti is the highest level of selflessness. Yeah. So that idea that it's a continuum, it's a spectrum, it's not a polar opposite. And that's how we grow in our spiritual life. Yeah. So yes, maybe it's a result of the first generation that most of the devotees were counterculture and then they rejected the mainstream culture to practice bhakti. Right. And then Prabhupada also, either Prabhupada presented things like that or the devotees gravitated toward those aspects of Prabhupada which were like that. Yeah. Years ago, we, we had a, you and I had a, a conversation um, and I'm not sure if you remember, but we were riffing off of the analogy of which, which you used a lot. I don't know if you still use it of the sort of the runway and like sattva being like a runway yeah. and right. Um, and one of the things in that conversation that, that that stuck with me was we kind of tweaked the analogy to say that in emergency cases, you have a helicopter. Yeah. Can you just share that? Because I, I, it was so, I, do, do you know this? Yeah. Okay. It, was, it was, I thought it was such a, a, like an insightful, it just cleared up so much for me as far as just okay. understanding sort of dynamics in ISKCON and yeah. Okay. So I'll give a bigger picture for this. There are two visions. That as I said, one is Tamas, Rajas, Sattva, then Shuddha Sattva. It's like a ladder. The other vision is that all of them are at this level and from anywhere you can take a Bhakti. So, Rajas, Tamas, Sattva, wherever you are, from there it just Bhakti is vertically up. Yeah. So now, both visions have validity. My understanding is that you can take off in Bhakti start off in bhakti from anywhere. If somehow somebody might be an alcoholic, a drug addict, if somehow they get attracted to holy name, they get attracted to some devotee, especially some powerful, pure or charismatic devotee, whatever, they might be able to take a bhakti. However, to sustain bhakti, sustenance is a function of sattva guna. So the takeoff can happen from anywhere, but the sustenance requires this incremental approach. Mm. So the, now the, the example is that that normally if you want to fly a plane, you need to come to the airport and there there is the run runway and there from there the airplane flies. And so if somebody is far away from the airport, that's like the person is in Tamaguna, somebody is very close to the airport as in Rajoguna, somebody is in the airport then Satvaguna. And they start practicing bhakti, that's like taking off the plane. And so now in emergencies, now, wherever a person is, you might take a helicopter over there and you start off from there. So in many ways, our first generation was like that emergency. From wherever you are, you start off bhakti. 
Art that was like that was like Prabhupada's mood, or, or necessarily, necessarily say, yeah, situationally it. necessarily, right? It's not ideal necessarily, but it's it's what Prabhupada was dealing with, and it was like exactly. from wherever you are, whoever you are, let's go. Take yeah, off. so that's uh, I not use the example for a long time. Thank you for reminding me of that. <laughs> so, so the helicopter is not something which we can. Uh, uh, we, the helicopter approach is not what we can use all the time. In fact, there's like, there's a one conversation of Prabhupada where he says. Uh, we have been operating in a kind of spiritual emergency, Prabhupada says. Mm. But now, we have to come out of that emergency. Now, of course, some devotees say that means we have to go back to strict Varanashram. And everything else is emergency. Uh, that's that's a different opinion. But but if we put aside the specifics of Varanashram, again, the principle of Varanashram is the incremental approach of yeah. rising up. So, yeah, so I feel that within our scripture, if we don't put them as as you said nicely in opposition to everything else there is some merit in that approach no doubt but uh, we are we are not going to not just attract a large number of people but we are also not going to benefit a large number of people like i'll tell you one real incident there's one boy from one top university in india so i met him in silicon valley and he is a follower of another spiritual organization now one of the biggest patrons sold out follower and he is he's a big one of, of another the, organization another organization he told me that he was introduced to bhakti through a one time program which i had done in one of the iits hmm? that you had done yeah i mean I, the devotees had organized for me obviously but so he said i liked it very much and he joined he started coming to the youth center staying there or staying there coming regularly mm. and then he said i loved the philosophy but i just I just found that the practical expectations were very high. And finally I decided, I just had so much conflict with myself. I felt this is the right thing to do, but I can't do it. I felt guilty. Finally, I just gave it up, but I had spiritual inclinations. So I found, I looked for a spiritual path that could sort of accommodate me where I was. Mm. So then I asked him, what was the demand that you felt? That you, he said, I just, you just can't give up. He said, you know, there's something which you asked for me, which I just couldn't give up. And what he told me just, he said, killed me literally. He said, since the age I was seven, every week I read two books. So the year I read hundred books. And when they told me, you cannot read any books apart from Prabhupada's books. I said, I can't do that. Oh, and I asked him what kind of books he read. And it was like self-help kind of books. It was biographies, not just like novels and something like that. Not not just like, I don't want to use like trash super motor. mundane. Not not, not, not super mundane. Not, stuff. not just um, like trashy. Not just trashy kind of things. Yeah. So it's really so now. Oh my god! <laughs> if somebody has a capacity to read a hundred books a year, oh, that's a, already a very special person. And oh. You tell them, so now what would have been lost if we had been reading those books and he had been reading Prabhupada's books? We would have had such a wonderful devotee. So I feel this confrontational approach sometimes makes Krishna consciousness more difficult than it needs to be for many people. And we only hear the success stories of our outreach. Yeah. Oh, but yeah. Yeah, <laughs> totally. We don't hear it's the okay. victims, the casualties, the collateral damage. Yeah. Mm. But there is a lot, unfortunately. So, now I don't, uh, I don't blame the devotees who told him that, because I understand they were trained in a particular way. But you know, somewhere, uh, that's that's a question which I recently gave a, a devotee, young devotee gave a class, and after that, uh, he asked me how to find a class. I told him, you know, that, the whole class was good, but that point was a little harsh. Then he gave me a strange look. I said, what happened? He says, oh, that was the point I had heard in your class only. <laughs> oh, yeah. That what was, was 20, the... 20, 25 years ago almost, 20 oh, years ago. He, hold, he heard an old class of yours where you made a, a point that you now, now find hard. Harsh. I wince. Yeah. I wince at that point. That's, uh, that's humbling, right? It's so very humbling. So then wow. I started thinking that, you know, that, okay, a misguided might be a strong word, but let me use that word right now. So, 
if I misguided others, uh, or is there like underguided, not misguided, you know, or did guide adequate properly? I misguided others because I was misguided. Mm. Then, to what extent am I responsible? If the chain has to stop somewhere, have to take we have, someone has to take responsibility. Sure. So I won't say misguided is the best word I'll have to think about, but it's just that uh, often seriousness in Krishna consciousness is equated with uh, with certain kind of extreme things. Yeah. Mm? Like don't read any other books. Okay. Yeah. I would say that it is it is uh, valid advice for someone who anyway does not have interest in reading. And for them, it's difficult to read anyway. And then if they are, you know, they, they, they only have the stamina or the capacity to read for a sh short while. And if that, then they're going to read many other books, then better read only Prabhupada books. Mm. But for somebody whose life is books, you know, tell them don't read books. You know, that they will, they will feel choked. They'll feel suffocated. They'll feel starved. It's like deprivation, just almost, exactly. it feels like deprivation for the sake of deprivation to that person. Yeah, right? exactly. Wow. The other thing, I mean, and you know, if you don't feel comfortable going in this direction, we don't need to. But I'm just struck by how now, like when I was younger, I probably would have heard a statement like that and would have kind of been like, yeah, that's like so hardcore. That must that must be like, you know, that's like pure Krishna consciousness. And now I hear that and not only do I not feel that way, but I also wince, you know, to use the word that you just used, um, because it also sounds very culty. It sounds very, it sounds oh, like yeah. a totalitarian thing. Like any organization that, you know, is telling mm. you like you are forbidden to read books by authors other than our founder. Like if you just take it out of the context of ESCON <laughs> and put it in the context of any other organization, it would sound so scary to me. But somehow because it's within my tradition, I don't feel like, like I, I was okay with it for a long time. Right. Yeah. Um, and so I don't know. So I, you know, I mean, I know it's going a little far afield from the point that you were originally making, but there is also something that it's not just about, you know, sort of a statement being harsh or or hardcore, but like, like, is there a point where it actually does start to feel like something cultish is going on here? Huh, that's a question I have pondered quite a bit. I'd say three things about it. First is that it's like education. Uh, if you are a small child, you are educating the child in colors. The education has to begin in the black and white. Mm. You start telling the child, right at the beginning there are shades of grey. Child will get completely confused. So, in one sense, maybe in the initial years, there is some advantage for a person to get grounded in one perspective. And now, of course, you could say in today's world, it's very difficult because with the internet and with social media available, yeah. anybody can hear from anywhere. But there is some virtue to that. But the challenge is that when does a person go ahead from black and white to shades of grey? So, I feel that often does not happen. All right. And that's where what you earlier said. We reify the black and white as the yeah, exactly. be all end all standard. So that's where I feel that context. That's where I, everything I try to, every statement of Prabhupada, look at the context. Every statement of Shastra, look at the context. That helps in removing that black and white kind of things. Yeah. So that, that next stage of shades of grey also has to be given. So maybe in the, maybe in the initial stages, okay, you get yourself grounded in this perspective. That's okay. But then it's important, very important that the subsequent education also be given. Yeah. Another point is that with respect to this not reading other books, like I said earlier, that some people are just not into reading much. So not everybody is very, uh, very intellectually inclined or even intellectually endowed. No, so, okay, a, uh, I remember one devotee told me, Sir, I come to Krishna, I'm so happy. I said, wonderful, what makes you happy? He said, in the past, I had such overthinking and decision paralysis. He says, now, I just follow what devotees told me to do. I don't All think. my anxiety is gone now. <laughs> now, when I hear it, I started getting some anxiety. <laughs> <laughs> now, from his perspective, it is a gain. 
yeah no yeah. but how long can a person be dependent like that yeah so in some way some people just need clarity for sure and they just don't want ambiguity and you know if you tell those people to look at shades of gray uh, not only will they not look at the shades of gray they will look at you with black eyes <laughs> i think the problem also comes when when you there have been devotees that have been practicing for a long time and it's continuing to stay black and white there's no gray that's where i think the problem lies and where that cultiness might come from there it's you know been we someone has been devotee for a long time but still there is that that black and white which in in one way is also is good also but also then you get weird behavior that kind of could turn someone off and say say something to someone like that the person that you spoke that you spoke about someone says something to them and they get turned off completely so one of the verses which i especially like in the bhagavad gita is 326 you know na buddhi bhedam janayet agyanam karma sanginam joshayet sarva karmani vidwan yukta samachara krishna is saying don't disturb the minds of others is given two levels mm. one is where you are detached and you are enlightened yeah and the other is somebody else is attached and that person is ignorant so krishna is don't disturb their minds rather he says give them a pathway for gradual Uplark, elevation yeah yeah so sometimes we just focus on destroying a person's world view <laughs> yeah but you know okay whatever is the whatever the flaws of that world view that is giving them some shelter and from there they need some shelter it's, you can't leave them shelterless that's a disservice so incrementally so the the gita so the gita's approach i do see there's a lot of uh, a lot of accommodation a lot of uh, places where say for example when arjuna says But the mind is very difficult to control. The first thing Krishna says is empathy. Yes, it's difficult. Asamshay mahabhav. Right, he doesn't jump to you know just be determined, control your yeah, mind. Yeah. It's no asamshay. Yes, undoubtedly it is very difficult. Undoubtedly, yeah. So in one sense, Arjuna is uh, he feels understood by Krishna. Like uh, so, that is understanding. It's almost like psychological oxygen. Without that, psychologically we will suffocate it. Some people are actually looking though to. for their world view to be destroyed and to be rebuilt. Yeah, so that's why you know I mean say that for confrontational outreach also there is a space. Mm. And I think there is always an audience for that also. Yeah. yeah totally. But the challenge is that when that is seen as the only way to do outreach faithfully. And you're right. not, yeah oh yes faithfully yeah. Yeah. And when everybody who is doing everything else is considered compromised, diluted, contaminated. Great preaching. Yeah, yeah. Some of that word bridge preaching has got a significant negative connotation now. Yeah. So this well, for this reason, right? Because it's sort of become like a euphemism for, or it's assumed to be a euphemism for something that's watered down or that's you know less than in some yeah. way. Yeah. True. And and to be fair, I mean, I, I think a part of it in a valid criticism is. if that bridge preaching is in and this might be something that we've we've talked about in the past as well um if it's being done in a mood of like sort of let me say the like the the kind of most politically correct like you know happy shiny friendly thing i can say to pull you in right it's like like a bait and switch i think we call yeah, it right yeah um i mean that I I think should be crit- criticized and critiqued. Um and I think uh, unfortunately a lot of sort of bridge preaching has become that. Or it's some yeah, it's some kind of like okay, oh, hey, you don't talk about Krishna or bhakti at all until the person is like, you know, sort of coming around enough and then you just spring it all on them. Yeah, like we don't want them to know that we're Yeah, we don't want Krishna's. them to know, right, right. Yeah. Um Yeah. Which that feels just very different than what what we've been talking about and what you're describing, right? Yeah, definitely. See, uh, mm, you know, I talk with Radha and Maharaj about this, and it is. I said to Maharaj, I, t- I tried traveling across the world, and many times some devotees tell me that your classes are too intellectual. So I said, Maharaj, it's not that I'm intentionally intellectual. That's just the way I think. It's difficult for me to change. So Maharaj said that you know you don't have to change. He said that. Uh, 
if uh gopal pro tries to be intellectual like you it won't work if you try to be humorous like gopal pro it won't work hmm. he said as far as i am concerned i am neither humorous like gopal pro nor intellectual like you the life that was my whatever abilities we have it's by your mercy and mahaj became grave he says but krishna has gifted me with a deep concern for people and with that concern in my heart whatever i speak it seems to inspire others so he that's, says that's pretty amazing wow. so he says you don't have to change yourself yeah. but increase your concern for your audience so i found that a profound statement and that's it's, i mean that's how i started doing this writing and drawing you know because i used to speak so many concepts that's one of the ways i discovered yeah. to make things easier yeah. to explain so but my point is na sometimes we are so caught in trying to faithfully reproduce what what we have been taught or what we think is taught in scripture that we are not concerned about the audience much yeah oh totally so, yeah so it's almost like the audience is an afterthought <laughs> if even a thought at all <laughs> yeah yeah the audience only role is to be like compliant players in the <laughs> <laughs> in the script that we have been given yeah so so yeah so if we increase our concern for our audience mm. then where they are from there let's take them forward so compassion of course we talk a lot about compassion but compassion doesn't just mean that giving dumping krishna on people you know yeah. like helping them take the steps by which they can come towards krishna yeah so can i tell you something that uh, i mean you may you may be already familiar with this you know the uh, philosopher kierkegaard mm. the existentialist yeah um so when you just said the thing about audience it just reminded me something that he said that i remember reading years ago and just always stuck with me is we tend to think like if we're i mean he was speaking from a christian context right so like if we're a preacher or a minister or whatever the person giving the sermon we think i'm the speaker or i'm the you know the actor so to speak and my audience is the audience and i'm performing right but he says if i remember this correctly he says that the speaker is like the like the bhagavatam speaker in our case right like the 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 preacher the minister the speaker is um is a is like a prompter so in these old fashioned plays they would have someone waiting in the wings who would give you your lines Beautiful. in case you need your lines. Oh. So the 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 person sitting on the vyasasan to use our language is the prompter. Oh wow. The people sitting the devotees or the people sitting in the audience are like the actor Actors. and God is the audience. God is the audience. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> wow. That's Kierkegaard? That's Kierkegaard. I hope I got it right. Someone can so correct cool. me in the comments if I didn't, but that's so right. essentially saying that you as the prompter or the preacher should be just prompting the actors to continue what they're you're you're doing. prompting them to act in bhakti so to speak right yes. your your words the class that you you give the class yeah. you know the class that you and I the classes you and I give are meant to be like that like just reminding our audiences yeah. of, for the audience of god to the audience of god to the right for them to perform we would say like to oh, to act you know to act in bhakti that's form. so nice and then for the pleasure of the real audience which is mm. god you know if you look at krishna consciousness we often define it in terms of how how what is krishna consciousness what is this person doing in the relationship with krishna or oh, this person eating meat this person is not chanting mm. for chanting this many rounds that's one parameter of krishna consciousness mm. but another parameter is what is krishna doing in this person's life mm. that person may not be doing any of the activities we think are krishna conscious but that does not mean krishna is no longer in their hearts so where is this person what wisdom what realization has got this god got this person to mm. god is acting in everyone's lives and you say they are they are foolish or whatever but even just to survive in this world is difficult You mm. need you need wisdom, may not be necessarily spiritual wisdom, but some level of wisdom you need. Yeah. So God has only provided that wisdom. So in one sense, where the person is at, we take help them move forward from where they are at. Mm. So that is uh, like 
God is already acting in that person's life. And so they are playing their play, they are playing their parts, and we have to understand what parts they are playing, what parts God is getting them to play, and help them forwards. So I find that approach is uh, it's definitely gradual. It's not going to give you a large number of people. But I do feel that that will get people who are more put together. Mm. Mm. People who are more at peace with themselves. Like what they say, you know, at home in your skin. Yeah. We say we are not the body, but this is the body we have for this lifetime. Mm. And we can't be in a state of constant conflict with this body. Mm. So people who are at peace with who they are and then they are moving forward for them from there. So... There's one more point which uh, I had in mind when you speak about that about Kierkegaard. Yeah, so when we talk about uh, sharing bhakti with others, one of the challenges I feel is that we have a lot of self-referential comparisons. That means, say for example, somebody has a dog. You, know, you should be attached to God. Why are you attached to dog? Hmm? But, and then we will tell the Bharat Maharaj story or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> that Bharat Maharaj story. The devotee yeah. parents have been using that on their devotee kids to like, you know, squash their dreams of getting a pet dog for years, right? Uh, now, now, I'm not necessarily supporting a pet dog here, but my point is something else. Yeah. That, you know, often, for where most people are at, especially in the Western world, God is not even in their horizon of their consciousness. Right. And, you know, when they are dealing with issues, maybe they're getting drunk, they're taking drugs, they're just on social media all day. If they get a dog, at least they take the dog out for a walk every day. You know, if if they are in de or they are, they are depressed and they're just taking pills to try to fight depression. You know, from where they are at, a dog might be the most sattvic way of coming out of their tamaguna. Mm. Yeah. From where they are at. So quite often we don't consider where they are at. So another example of self referential comparison is say that 16 rounds, you know, chanting is so easy in the past. You know, there were 60,000 years of tapasya, elaborate yagyas. <laughs> you know, it's like we have only created this comparative scale. Means right. our scripture are there. <laughs> yeah. But the audience is, they are comparing 16 round chanting with 20 minutes Sudarshan Kriya. Isn't it? Or for maybe 10 minutes of this mantra chanting or 10 minutes of doing this or 10 minutes that. So the demands that we make from people are quite high. Yeah. Now, of course, there is a reward for those demands, for all that thing. But the point is that we, we are so caught in uh, our own reference points and then patting ourselves on the back. Oh, we are so good. But the world is at a very different place. And that's why being aware of where the world is at. One of, one of the points about reading other books, it's uh, it's not just cultish, it's just we are not aware of where the world is at. And then we may still reach people, but there's a lot of people uh, will not reach Krishna because of the we present, maybe we present Krishna. Mm. So there will always be serious spiritual people people who are from their previous lives have some level of spirituality and they will, however we present Krishna consciousness, you know, it's like sometimes it's people come to Krishna in spite of us, not because of us also. <laughs> but, um, in spite of us. Sorry? In spite of us, yeah. Yeah. But the thing is that there are so many more people who can be benefited by Krishna's wisdom. Yeah. But then when we present it in a very black and white way, very confrontational way, very self-referential way, then they just feel that this is just impractical. It's just irrelevant or impractical. What do you mean by self-referential? No, oh, you know, our process is so easy. Mm. You, know, you don't have to go to a forest and uh, renounce the world and do the Pasya for 60,000 years. Just add Krishna to your life. Just chant 16 rounds. It's so easy. Mm. Well, 16 rounds is with all due respects. Yeah. It's not easy. It is challenging. So, so by self-referential, you mean we are so locked into kind of our scale of things yeah. that we've lost the ability to empathize with with what most 
other people are how most other people would hear or or think about things yeah yes exactly right i see what your point is but i feel that could be said about anything like you can say that about okay um okay this person eats meat or something and then you're like that's that's you know we don't support that but at least they're not i don't know eating people <laughs> like, yeah, what's the, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I'm like waiting for non to feel like at I least they're not that. cannibals. Like cannibals. Yeah. I was thinking that. Do, do you feel do you see what my point is? Like it could you could easily just not justify, but maybe justify anything. Okay. For the sake of just saying, oh, they're it at least it's better than whatever they are. Yeah, at right? least it's better than that. No, yeah, so that's possible. But I am saying here that people have hundreds of options. Mm. Yeah. And when I'm not all that I'm saying is the psychology where a person is coming from, are they doing it for the motives which we are ascribing to them? I'm not saying whether that is right or wrong. I'm saying that people are doing, the, somebody says, this particular just because of lust. Yeah. Is that the reality? The motive that we are ascribing to people is that the motive that is driving them to do that? Or is that just our standard? Projection of, yeah. of something. Proje right. So I'm not saying that it, uh, like that, anything could be justified. I'm not yeah. talking about the rightness or wrongness of this. I'm the right, see, there is the rightness and wrongness of the activity that is being done. But I'm talking about the rightness and wrongness of the motive we are ascribing to that activity. Hmm. Yeah. We are saying it's just lust. But from their point of view, it may be something more than lust. Right. In fact, if it's just lust, then no, people can gratify their lust much more by being with new people every day. Right. Yeah. So it's a, it's a, it's more it's a more reasonable like if you if you have to assume a motive one way or the other, it's more reasonable that that it's not just lust that it's that there's okay. something All else that I'm going saying on. Is that I, I, the point I was making is like we are self. I'm really trying to pin you into saying yeah. something about. Aren't I? Okay. <laughs> and no, I, and what I'm saying is that it's just a self-referential right. frame. From our perspective, it's just lust. Oh yeah. But from their perspective, it is not. Mm. Like say the abortion issue. Right. You know, okay, you're killing a child. Okay. Yeah, That's that, a good example, yeah. That is the true. But then, you know, we also have to consider why a woman is brought to a place where she has to even consider that decision. Right. And if you're not going to address that issue and say just killing of a child, then no, we're not saying in any way that... Uh, that the abortion is right or abortion is good. Not at all. I'm just saying that, you know, people have become so heartless. People have just, people have just become so, uh, so deadened to their conscience that they kill their own babies. Well, that's it. End of story. That's like yeah. the, you're saying that's when, when we're doing the self-referential yeah. ascribing motive, we just, we leave it at that. We just say, yeah. it's killing, it's murder. People are so heartless. Just see how demonia, Kali Yuga, the yeah. end, period. But is that the reason why people are doing it? One reason that maybe they just don't know. Many people they just think it's just like a tissue removal or something like that. That's That that could be one thing. Another is that you know, maybe they are economically, psychologically, sociologically at a place where they feel that is the only alternative that they have. Right. Now that, 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 Does that mean that alternative right? Well, from a, one, it's still killing. But, you know, it's not heartlessness that is pushing them there. Right. Now, of course, what to speak of if somebody has been violated and then they're put in that situation. Yeah. So my point only is here one thing. is Examples are provocative. But we, when we are self-referential, we see certain actions and ascribe certain motivations for those actions based on our understanding of the world that we have got from the way we have been taught Shastra. Yes. But that may not at all be the reason why that person is doing that thing. Or, that means or maybe it may be a part of it. Only one part of it. One part of it. What's wrong with doing that, though? Well, we just alienate people. So practically, so, so, so it's basically not those, very helpful to build, to, to build any kind of connection so, to anyone, right? So those people will just say, no, you just don't get me. And yeah. I don't care to get you. Mm -hmm. So we're just losing a lot of people. So I saw... Uh, so... so just, just to hang on, but please don't lose the, the point that you're about to make. So I think one thing that that is wrong on the practical level is it's just, it's not effective. It's not effective to 
to relationship building. It's not effective to mm. connecting with people. It's not effective to building trust and faith and all these things, right? Yeah. Um, but I'm wondering, even beyond the sort of practical, because what I'm hearing is when we do that, what we're we're sort of denying complexity. Nicely put. Yeah, we're only ascribing right. So if we're denying, and the, and the world is is actually complex. So is it? Am I am I reaching too far to say that beyond even just the sort of practical effect of alienating people, which is bad, but even beyond that, there's something that actually is like there's something that's incomplete. When we do that, we're not actually fully understanding or appreciating the way the world works. True, very true. Yeah. So, you know, it's like I see two trajectories. You know, somebody says a strong devotee. So devotee means strong faith. Mm. Strong faith means certainty. Mm. This is right, this is wrong. You could take completely with the same strong devotee means deep humility. Mm. Humility means there are many things that I don't know. Humility means Comfort with complexity, comfort with uncertainty. Hmm. That's you interesting. Know, Those are two distinct trajectories. Right. And they can come, at one level go completely divergent. Yeah. So somebody uh, may be very gentle in, uh, in evaluating or judging, not because they are compromised, but because they just try to understand the complexity of the situation. And somebody else may say, you know, you're just watering down everything. You don't have the courage to speak there. Mm. This is right, this is wrong. So in general, in our moment, this trajectory, strong devotee means strong faith. Strong faith means certainty. certainty. That's what has been generally seen as the, as the characteristic of strong devotion. But mm. strong devotion could also mean humility. The world is far bigger than me and even in this and God is acting in this world in far more complex ways than what I have figured out. Wow. So let me let me try to understand what is going on. It's beautiful. Yeah. I feel like you're about to about to say something and I cut you off. Oh yeah. Mm. Well a lot of thoughts are going on, but I will say just uh, maybe one or two points. See coming to that Black and white kind of the Sarvadharma and Parityaj, you know, where somebody said that this is as a conclusion of the Gita. So Krishna says, in 1863, he says that deliberate and do as you desire. Mm. So this is where Krishna is respecting Arjuna's intelligence, respecting his independence. Now you do as you desire. Mm. But then, as I was talking about this, one devotee said to me that, what? Soon Krishna says, Sarvadharma and Parityaj. So that? So to that, so you know, so that cancels out. That cancels it out. Hmm. So you know, so that is a that is a previous instruction. This is the real instruction. Is that now? Okay, let's look at the Acharya's commentaries over there. What is going on over there? Krishna tells Arjuna, "Do as you desire." And then Arjuna starts thinking, "What? What does Krishna want me to do?" And then, when Krishna sees that, then Krishna Krishna opens his heart. So we could say in one sense, 1864, 65, 66, they are meant specifically for Arjuna. Hmm. Of course, we can they can apply for others, but I'll explain the difference. Say, like there is a there is say somebody has a child who is very sick, and they go to a doctor, and the doctor says these are your treatment options. You could try about cancer, you could try chemotherapy, you could try radiotherapy, this, 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 this. And then now you think about it and you tell me what you would like to do. If at that time the the parent asks, Doctor, if this had happened to your child, <laughs> what would you what would you do? Mm. Wow. Then what the pre doctor said previously is also valid. But here the discussion goes into a very different dimension. Mm. <laughs> so it is. It is that way that Krish, Arjuna is asking Krishna. And that's why Krishna says, you know, that now I'll tell you the most confidential knowledge. Sarva guyatamam bhuya, shunume paramam vacha. The most confidential. And then he says, man mana bhaumad bhakto. And then sarvadharma and paritich. So in one sense, what he's saying over there is that you just surrender to me. It's like a doctor saying, you know, this is the treatment you take. And if there's any complications, I will take care of it. 
अहम तो आम स्वरूप आप भी मोक्ष सो इट्स ऑलमोस्ट लाइक डॉक्टर सिंग आई टेक अनलिमिटेड लाइबिलिटी वॉट एवर है सो इट इज डेफिनेटली इट्स अ रिवेटिंग एक्सप्रेशन ऑफ कृष्णाज हार्ट फिल्ड विथ लव बट दैट इज बी एक्सप्रेस्ड वेन अर्जुना इज इज सीकिंग दैट एंड दैट्स वाई इमीजिएटली ऑफ सर्व धर्मान प्रत्यज कृष्णा इमीजिएटली सॉर्ट ऑफ स्टेप्स बैक यू नो से इदम ते ना तपस का आई डोंट टेल दिस टू एवरी वन Mm. Don't tell to this two not That's who are not austere, those who are not devoted, those who are not uh, having a serious attitude, those who are envious. Don't tell it to them. So the point is that this is an elevated level, and do we want people to come to this level? Of course, but do we, can we force everyone to get there? No. Do we want to leave no space for people who can't get there? No. So yeah. this is there a way, like an express way, for everyone to come towards bhakti? There is, but is. that what everybody can do no is that uh, do we want to reject people who can't do that no so i mean also do, do, like don't they have to get there themselves for it to matter for it to be real yeah for them to really experience for all, for all of us to really experience that you know what happens in those in those shlokas that magical kind of space so beautifully what we yeah. actually have to get there we can't just have someone else just you know feed it to us as so many times you would say that you know, if only had my my childhood had come to bhakti it would have been so nice well maybe but you know maybe at that time you might not have valued it yeah totally so we have to go through certain you experiences to, through, yeah. to be at the level where we can actually appreciate bhakti so yeah so it's a uh, so krishna does not reject those who don't come to that level in fact krishna is telling us don't force everyone to that level he mm. said don't share this with everyone right so don't force it to everyone so it's a uh, the krishna's loving heart is coming out in the gita but uh, but krishna is not insisting that everybody has to be at that level so arjuna is at that level but others are and, and you see prabhupada also in his outreach he had indians in india you know not much change in india between 1960s when prabhupad left india to come to america and 1970s when prabhupad came back to india india was still the same and was it that india was suddenly interested in serious spirituality no it was the most of the interest that people had in india after prabhupad came back was more of like cultural nationalism mm -hmm. oh these people had ruled us for so long right and now they are taking up our culture yeah <laughs> and prabhupad used that so if you see among the thousands and thousands of people who became life members whose houses prabhupad went to hardly anyone actually became an initiated disciple and most of the life members if you look at their histories they were already well established society they were already well established in their spirituality also and many of them had commitments to other gurus other lineages and prabhupad engaged them they appreciated what prabhupad had done and they wanted to assist him Prabhupada engaged them. Oh, uh, there was one prominent life member. Uh, he was a he was one of the leading disciples of a Mayavadi guru. And uh, so, when he was departing from the world, you know, he was well known. So several of our sannyasi leaders went and met him. So one of the one of our sannyasi gurus, he told me that, and I was there with him. He was so frail, clearly on his deathbed, but he saw me. He started glorifying Prabhupad. He says, "Swami, you are so amazing. He did this. He did that." So I was sitting and hearing him, and I was thinking that when he departs from the world, you know, is Krishna going to see that he was initiated by Mayavadi Guru, or is Krishna going to see that his heart has so much appreciation for my pure devotee Prabhupad? Mm. He said, "In in my small understanding, Krishna is Bhavagrahi." Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so the point i'm making is prabhupad was not just a one zero kind of thing yeah prabhupad also he okay this is what you can do you do that would he have loved it if all the life members had become 16 rounders initiated devotees just yes, definitely but did prabhupad reject them because they were not ready to do that no this kind of dynamic shila prabhupad we speak about that we frozen in some ways prabhupad in a certain amount of time with lectures or letters or something 
and the dynamic Prabhupada doesn't come out now as much as when we hear these stories like that. It's like a very dynamic, you know, yeah. personality. But nowadays, it's that it's he's frozen. It's almost like we present Prabhupada as this like fixed in time, certain like embodiment of certainty, and it's like it's black very it's very black and white, right? Like a lot mm. of not everyone, but a lot of times, it's like you know this this kind of like Prabhupada said for all time. <laughs> and then yeah. you hear these stories of this kind of the fluidity of Prabhupada, the flexibility of Prabhupada, the Prabhupada who tries things and then pivots and tries something else, right? Yeah. The Prabhupada who kind of says, like the Prabhupada who prays on the Jaladuta, right? Like so much that that dynamism, yes. I think we've been talking about this, that, yes. that we worry sometimes that that's, that that's something that, that feels like it's, yeah, like missing from a lot of the glorification oh, of Prabhupada. Nice. I think we have to end there but Prabhu that was wow. really fantastic thank you so much for spending time with us and discussing ideas and concept and your experiences I'm happy bro this was an amazing discussion yes and it'll get me to an amazing amount of trouble I feel <laughs> oh no <laughs> no come you, on we don't want to put you in the hot seat right? uh, no I put myself there <laughs> <laughs> well you have to be true to who you are right well thank you so much if you uh you know, if you get into any kind of trouble at all, please remember Nam Russ is the host. I'm just some guy who hangs out here occasionally. I take no responsibility or liability. I take full responsibility. I take full responsibility. No, Nam is, he's courageous. He's, he's like, bring it on. No, I, I honestly, I think um, there can be difference of opinion and that's fine. But one thing that I really, really appreciate is um, just the reminder for complexity and nuance and even just thoughtfulness in terms of how to approach yes. these things. And I feel like, yeah, if there are folks that maybe do disagree with some of the things that you've said here or that feel, you know, that there's something that you're saying that's problematic in some way, I would just, you know, hope that they could express whatever they find problematic in as much of a complex and, and yeah. thoughtful way. And we can have just dialogue and conversation about it, right? Like no yeah. one's claiming to be perfect. Exactly. Um, so yeah, I'm open just, to yeah. exploring and understanding. Yeah, so I feel that uh, there's a lot more for me to learn and life is a, in fact, the joy of life is in learning for me. So I feel this, it's not that. Uh, in many ways, what I shared is just uh, some of the things that I've learned and uh, we keep learning, we keep growing. In one sense, it's almost like every year you feel, you know, I'm discovering what is Krishna consciousness. Mm. And then next year you feel, okay, that was not Krishna conscious at all. <laughs> I feel a lot of similarities between Rajabihari Prabhu's discussion we had and, and Chaitanya Chana Prabhu, like in the evolution of a brahmachari, like evolving into something that's like really, not that you weren't real before, but like a very real evolved, wholesome kind of experience that you shared in your evolution as a devotee and as a brahmachari, Rajvi Hari Prabhu also shared similar things. So, I, I'm really glad to see that. That's, yeah, yeah. I think we need more, more, of those, more of that. Those, yeah. those examples, those narratives of yeah, ex exactly examples development and growth and yeah. authenticity. Mm -hmm. So yeah, thank, thank you. you for that. Thank you, thank you so much. As always, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. How long do we go? Okay. Krishna Hare Krishna Krishna 